Have you ever been so overwhelmed by self-doubt that it was paralyzing? Or maybe instead of becoming stagnant, you created this persona, this character that you expected yourself or you wanted yourself to be, but inside you were someone completely different. Imposter syndrome is a psychological term for a pattern of behavior where you are not able to accept your accomplishments and the things going on in the outside world are so different and you fear that you're gonna be exposed as a fraud. For Jessica, the life she was living on the outside was so incredibly different than what she was feeling and experiencing on the inside that that gap um, mixed in with her genetic history of mental illness and depression is really what led to a pattern of destructive behaviors for her um, that she'll now share with you in her story. For me, mental health and mental illness has always been there. It's always been a shadow that's been a part of my life. If I think about it from my grandfather's perspective, which I think is a little bit more impactful, his father, sister, and one of his children all committed suicide. So there's been three generations of suicide in the family. And so it obviously is a part of our nature as far as genetics go, mental illnesses. Definitely strongly in our genetics, but you know, you also learn your coping mechanisms and emotional regulation from your parents. They're your models. And if your parents are dealing with their own mental health issues, they never learn that. And as a result, you never learn that. And so mental illness ends up getting perpetuated through the genes and also through the models that you have. And so I can't remember a time where I wasn't aware that mental illness was in the family. And I can't ever remember a time where I wasn't, like I always knew that something was wrong with me. Like that's the, the self-talk that I had was that there was something, there was like a darkness or like a heaviness that was a part of me from a very young age. And it was kind of just always this specter that was looming. And I, So you talked about the dark, you always felt this darkness. Yeah. Do you remember how young you were? Like. Always, 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 like from the age of five, like I, or maybe even before then, uh, there was a real disconnect between me and the world. I felt very, like I felt intense feelings and intense loneliness and that I just wasn't able to connect with people in a way that I saw others making connections. You noticed the difference. I doubt it's the difference and it felt like I said it always felt like there was like this heaviness or weight or like this dark part of me that was really scary and mm. I just knew that like there was something wrong but I didn't know what that looked like mm. and did your parents know about that at the time no my parents are they're great like we are very close they're very loving I never doubted that they loved me and um, you know, they were supportive and all of that. But I think with the impact that mental illnesses had on their families and their history, I think it was something that it was too difficult for them to see, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. And there was also a lot of chaos kind of in the extended family. We had moved from uh, Illinois to California when I was four mm -hmm. and so we were the only five that were out here they didn't have any of their family there was no support system they were trying to make ends meet and I think I saw kind of the chaos that was happening and certain people in my family have very bad tempers and would lose their tempers and get very angry and it felt very unsafe and scary um, you're one of how many kids three three and you're the middle, middle. okay yeah, and so it was, I saw how that impacted like the family and how being angry or expressing feelings to me just seemed like out of control and don't do that. That's kind of how I felt as a kid. So instead I just internalized everything mm -hmm. and kind of just put it in this little box inside of me and never talked about it and instead really kind of leaned into perfectionism and 
achievement. I thought if I could, you know, be good enough in school or be good enough at sports or, you know, get enough gold stars and whatever activity, then maybe that would make my parents happy or like it would make things better. Uh, maybe it would make me feel more normal or connected mm-hmm. or like make other people like me. Mm-hmm. And so I really kind of leaned into that in a way that was very unhealthy <laughs> now that I have yeah. gone through therapy yeah. and all yeah. of that stuff. So- I don't think anyone was aware. aware. Um, like I had suicidal ideation from the time I was like five or six. Like I can like remember the first time that I like had planned it. Like just the intensity of the emotions and the loneliness that I was feeling was just so much for someone who's so young and not able to comprehend anything beyond that moment and not knowing what to do with all of those emotions because to me expressing them was scary because when I saw people express their anger, that was terrifying. And so I really just shut everything down and I would disassociate a lot. I would play, I mean, I was kind of a very independent kid anyways, but I would play at a dollhouse. And so I would sit by my dollhouse for hours, like hours and hours and hours and just kind of fall into this fantasy world or realm or life and just completely disassociate from what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I think That was hard for my parents too, because I think they just thought I was an independent player, like, and that I could go off. They appreciated it. Exactly. And they didn't really recognize that there was some warning signs Mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Um, And I didn't know either. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't. Yeah, it was, um, it was definitely a coping mechanism. It was something that I had control over and I could be or play or create like a perfect family dynamic or whatever story that I wanted to. And I think a lot of times I was not even actually playing with my toys. Like I think I was just disassociating and almost like out of body experience, like where I would lose time too. So you started kindergarten at five Mm -hmm. and did you, was it easy to make friends? Did you know? No, that was probably where I noticed the most. Like I can remember recesses like uh walking around the playground by myself and like feeling this overwhelming sense of disconnection and that like why didn't anyone want to play with me like why was I so different why did I feel so different like just really overwhelming sadness like never would cry or anything like that because that was also kind of um instilled in us like we kind of were told to you know like tough it out and like very common things um my dad is one of four boys and he had three girls and he, we were very physical. Like he would, you know, we would play hockey and like roller skate and do all these things. And so I think one of the coping mechanisms that I ended up learning from that was um, I would get praise when I was tough and didn't cry if I got hurt. And that was like a, a place where like I could find strength and like control. Um, and and so, feedback and positive feedback, knowledge. yeah. And not like he had any idea. Like, yeah. he was just trying to comfort me in a way that made sense to him. Yeah. Um, but I think as a result, that ended up being the coping mechanism that I would go to, whereas I would just shut my feelings down inside. Or, uh, like, I started, pl- I would say, like, playing around or, like, entertaining the idea of self-harm, like, at a pretty young age as you well. to that? By no, I can't. Like, it's one of those things where, like, I really have struggled to remember it, and it it's almost like like the dollhouse thing where I would like lose time or I would lose, um, like I can remember like poking myself with like needles, like, and and, and I was very sick for in first grade. I had scarlet fever, but it wasn't actually scarlet fever. Mm-hmm. It was some sort of other infection, and I like woke up with morning and couldn't feel my legs and. Mm-hmm. Like I, it was a period of months where like I was in the hospital or not in the hospital, but in the doctor's office getting blood taken and doing tests. So I think, I don't know if that stemmed from it too, like where I could do that. And I got, again, I got praise when I didn't cry. And like, um, so I can like remember playing with like a button or a pin and like poking that into my skin to like see what that would feel like. Or I can remember like rubbing a key. A lot of it was very tactile too. So I didn't know at the time, but, um, I have ADHD and so a lot of stuff like yeah. it goes undiagnosed in girls because I didn't have the the physical outward symptoms right. um, but a lot of what was happening 
now through the lens of realizing that I had ADHD makes complete sense wow. as far as the hyper focus with playing and you know getting lost and yeah. um, feeling like it was so difficult for me to make connections um, whether that was social or even like when I was in a classroom but it just felt like I had to work so hard and it was never quite achieving enough or being enough or just that real negative self-talk uh, I learned from a very young age and became a very huge part of my thinking process and was very normalized into like everything that I did yeah. was just everything was my fault even if someone hurt me or if I was upset about something it was my fault why couldn't I be stronger why couldn't I be this why couldn't I be that mm. um, why couldn't I fix it I think I kind of took on the role of like the fixer in my family even though no one asked me to like I felt like I could try and help make my parents smile or you know make my sisters feel better that's something that I've really had to when you're the fixer then you can't be the one who has the problem and so that uh, ended up kind of compartmentalizing a lot of emotions as a result of that Yeah. yeah so um because I remember you as very outgoing and mm-hmm. lots of friends, and that's kind of, I think, where we came in at Bernardo. I mean, that's yeah. what I remember of you in Bernardo. Yeah, it's crazy to think. I was uh, kind of curious to see, because I worked so hard to portray, like, a certain image, mm-hmm. I was curious to see, like, I, mean, I think a lot of people thought I was so confident and, like, put together and, like, knew exactly who I was and... Friendly, easygoing. Yeah. just could kind of mingle with anybody. Yeah, and that was, um, like, junior high was probably one of the most painful periods. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, (laughs) it was the start of very painful periods. Um, I think because of hormones and everything like that, it really just kind of escalated um, all the feelings that I was already feeling. And that was when I started cutting as a coping mechanism in particular. So I'd already like kind of played around with the idea. Um, there was also a suicide in my family when I was in fifth grade, um, one of my mom's siblings. And when that happened, it was like, I'd already known something was wrong with me from a very young age. I had already had ideas about it, like had written suicide notes once and like just completely like played around with that idea without even really understanding what it was. Mm-hmm. Um, but like the idea of not feeling this overwhelming amount of like sadness and emptiness, like that's what I wanted to stop, I think. Um, and when that happened, I think it really like, it added another layer. Like I was like, oh, that's what, that's going to happen to me. Like eventually it's going to get to a point where I feel so much and I'm so overwhelmed that that's what, what I'm going to do. And so then that's in the back of your mind and I can't ever remember a time where I didn't know that someone in my family had committed suicide, mm-hmm. but it's never talked about. So it's like, you know it. And it's like this thing that you're supposed to keep in the dark and it's shameful and it's, you know, no one talks about it. You see the pain that it causes, but you don't talk about it. And I think that ends up being really challenging because um, you don't even have the language or anything to be able to express like how you're feeling or like this fear that you have, but like you're constantly living with it and it just is eating at you. So, and at that point I was very... I mean, I think obsessive compulsive behavior becomes a part of ADHD as well. And so like getting perfect grades or looking a certain way um, or, you know, being invited to certain things like that became, I became so obsessive about that. Like I can- In middle school. In middle school. Mm -hmm. Like it was, like I would just lose it if I got a B on a test. Like it was literally the end of the world. I would be so mad at myself and just like mentally like, reaming myself like how could you do that just such negative self-talk um and then I started cutting with um probably with scissors I would say um or or like rubbing like that was another form of self-harm like I would scrape and scrape Mm -hmm. until Mm -hmm. like I would see blood and it wasn't consistent so it's definitely a coping mechanism it would get to a point where like I had so much feeling and emotion in me. I didn't, I couldn't take it anymore. And so like the only thing I could think to do was make myself physically hurt. And like that was, and that was something that I could deal with Mm -hmm. and like something that I could see and process. So I would say like, like I said, it was a coping mechanism. So it wasn't like it was all the time. Mm -hmm. It was really like when it got really bad. Um, And just this idea of, I think partly being in gate too, um, the gifted and talented education program, 
I can't imagine what my life would have been like if I hadn't been in it because having ADHD, like that probably was why I was able to be successful because the pace and everything else. But we were so socialized that like everything in life was to get into college. Like that was life or death. Like we used to practice um, bubbling in like scantrons, like efficiently and that quickly. Was elementary school? That was an elementary oh, school. Wow. Yeah. And just the level of competitiveness of it. So it was like, even in middle school, it's like, oh, if I got a bad grade or if I didn't get into leadership or if I didn't do this or I didn't do that, then like I was going to fail at life. Like it was very much all or nothing thinking and I didn't have any sort of scale of what was like an appropriate amount of emotion to have about a situation and what wasn't. Right. And so that would happen a lot. Like I remember being absolutely devastating and wanting to die because I got a B in math one year and so I wasn't on the principal's luncheon. Like mm. I didn't get to go to the principal's luncheon and all my friends were and I thought I was a failure and I was never gonna amount to anything. And like school was our job. It wasn't like we were got to be kids. Like what was important was getting good grades yeah. Yeah. or you weren't gonna get into UCLA. Like right. that was the mentality. Like right. if I didn't do everything right all the time, I wasn't gonna get into UCLA and then I would be a failure right. at life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. is really funny because um, like the principal luncheon thing was like one of the most devastating things in, in junior high. Like everyone else had gotten their invitations and were going and I just was like crying all the time, like by myself and I'm pretty sure that was an instance where I would have cut and I just felt like everything was falling apart. And then when I was a senior in high school, um, my counselor actually recommended me to go back and give like the speech at the yeah. principal's luncheon at Bernardo. Yeah. Um, and by that point, like I had already been cutting full fledged. I had had a suicide attempt under my belt. Like, and here I was standing in front of a room that I didn't belong in when I was in junior high and was like devastated that I didn't mm. belong in. And now here I am giving a speech, like motivating these kids about how they're supposed to. And were you still cutting at that point? Totally. Oh. Totally. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it was a really weird. I think that's one of the challenges, especially women who have ADHD and are successful. Like your, your idea of who you are in your head is so different than the perception and you work really hard at that but at the same time you don't feel any of that so like it should have been a great moment and like accomplishment that like my counselor felt that I was a very well-rounded student I was very involved in student government in high school and things like that and I also was a very good student so she wanted me to go and speak to like having a holistic high school experience mm -hmm. to these junior high kids and I just remember being like oh my god like I wasn't even I felt like a complete folk like just so fake and so phony. Mm -hmm.